Welcome to a new organic synthesis video. I can tell you with utmost confidence that this is a really nice and instructive one, so it's great to have you with me. To the people wondering about what happened to me, I was just pretty busy with other stuff, but I promise this video won't be my last one in this new decade. Based on a <clears throat> very representative community poll, it looks like most of you are interested in modern approaches. That's why today we will cover, in my opinion, one of the nicest total syntheses of 2019. You ask for modern, funky syntheses, you shall have them. We'll learn a lot about organic chemistry. For example, why it can be interesting to study unfunctionalized molecules. We will also expand our knowledge regarding retrosynthesis of complex molecules. What to do, what not to do, as well as some nice tricks to have up your sleeve. In addition, we will talk about structural elucidation of molecules and about a really funny discovery I made while doing literature research. Before we dive into the video, please like it and subscribe to my channel. I'm always super happy about comments and feedback, so let me know whether you found the topic as exciting as I did. Also, warm welcome if you're new to the channel. I create videos on organic synthesis that should be entertaining and useful regardless of your synthesis knowledge. If you're a complete noob, you will enjoy the trivia I share around the topics. If you know some basic reactions, you will recognize numerous transformations and see how they're applied to a real problem. And if you're a serious organic chemist, you will appreciate the elegant approaches we cover in their entirety. Alright, to introduce today's molecule, I wanted to share some bits of the Taxol story with you. This molecule is an anti-mitotic agent and used to treat cancer. At their peak, yearly sales of Taxol amounted to 1.6 billion US dollars. It's still used nowadays, but to a lesser degree as safer and more effective drugs have somewhat replaced it. But how did it all start? Well, in the 1960s, the US National Cancer Institute partnered with the US Department of Agriculture to search for possible cancer cures from natural sources. They found Taxol in the Pacific yew tree. If you've seen my other videos, you can imagine that the isolation wasn't high yielding. For 10 grams of Taxol, 1.2 tons of Pacific yew bark had to be harvested. The slow growing nature of the Pacific yew and increasing demand for the compound triggered organic chemists to investigate synthetic approaches towards Taxol. At some point, you actually had 30 research groups all around the globe competing to get the first synthesis. The syntheses that have been developed since could actually be a nice topic for a next video. Let's fast forward to 2014. This is when a team of French and Spanish biologists looked at the Pacific U's cousin, the European U. The endophytic trichoderma fungus present in the tree bark was found to produce complex natural products that were similar to taxol but have a different carbon skeleton. This class of natural products, derived from the so-called Harsiane skeleton, remains a topic of high interest and there have been numerous reports on their bioactivities. These Harsianes here, gathered from coral-derived fungi, are for example useful for killing amaranth and lettuce seedlings. If that doesn't motivate you to embark on a multi-year synthetic adventure, I don't know what will. Jokes aside, today's target is actually much more useful as it displayed some antibacterial and cytotoxic activity. It's the complex molecular structure though that makes it really interesting for synthetic chemists. It doesn't even have a name, which makes it even more badass. This alternative molecular representation could look less confusing to you, but still, it's a beast. Today we'll explain its synthesis step by step. When looking at the literature, I found something really hilarious. You see, the initial publication in 2014 characterized the natural product and the French-Spanish team thought it looks like this. Hot off the press, I found a 2020 publication about the isolation of new Harsianes. If you compare their structures, you'll notice that only the stereochemistry of the carbinol is different. It looks like the Chinese team isolated a diastereomer of the 2014 molecule. As we will see at the end, the 2014 team had not correctly assigned the stereocenter, which is why the Chinese team thought that they found a new molecule. But uh, they actually didn't though, both are talking about the same molecule. Because the total synthesis was just recently published, the Chinese team probably didn't see it during their manuscript preparation. Alright, let's talk synthesis. 
But how do you decide on which bonds to disconnect when the entire molecule is just aliphatic? You can't just cut up aliphatic CC bonds and expect to have a chemically sound approach. In retrosynthesis, it's usually the functional groups that guide your thinking. This reminds me of cubane, which was first synthesized in 1964. As the name suggests, it's a cube made out of carbon-carbon bonds. The trick in such cases is to retrosynthetically introduce functional groups that aid the construction of the molecule, but can also be readily removed at the end to afford the unfunctionalized target. That means that we have more flexibility, but this retrosynthetic option space also increases the complexity of our approach. As a guide for our discussion, we will use the synthesis of Professor Carrera at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. He traced back the complex natural product structure to this funky intermediate and ultimately this readily available starting material through some impressive transformations. As the only functional group is a tertiary hydroxyl group, it makes sense to start the retrosynthesis there and derive it from the exocyclic olefin. That means the last step of our forward synthesis is hydration of this olefin here. As said, we need some functional groups in here to get some sensible disconnections. Carrera did it with help of these two hydroxyl groups that can be easily removed via barton macomby deoxygenation. Of course, you could think about introducing other functional groups in other places. There are a gazillion solutions to this on paper, but this route is what actually worked in real life after a lot of trial and error. Continuing the disconnections, one alcohol was traced back to the ketone and the homoallylic alcohol was traced back to the ketone as well via Wittig reaction. Why would we do this, you might ask? Well, the beta-hydroxy ketone that's present now is the keying element for an aldol reaction. This is one of the staple disconnections in organic synthesis. Of course, there's other reactions to construct a motif, but the elegant thing in Carrera's approach is that the aldol precursor, this intermediate ketoaldehyde here, can be accessed from this cyclohexene. So if you oxidatively cleave the double bond, you get the ketoaldehyde that will engage in the desired intramolecular aldol reaction if you add some base. Next, let's shift our attention to the seventh membered ring. This beta-substituted ketone motif screams conjugate addition of a methyl group to the corresponding enone. If you wonder about the diastereoselectivity of this process, excellent point. We will discuss the stereochemistry of this step during the forward synthesis. Cool thing now is that this enone can be derived from an aldol reaction as well. You just need to eliminate the hydroxyl group after addition of the enolate to the aldehyde. The ETH folks actually did it via the imine, not the aldehyde, because that was easier to access. You can get the imine as an intermediate from the corresponding nitrile after reduction. So to summarize, you reduce the nitrile, trigger the intramolecular aldol reaction and eliminate the amino group in the aldol adduct to give you the unsaturated ketone. There are a couple of transformations that we will skip for now to focus on the key step of the synthesis. They found an amazing way to access the tricycle here from this compound via a gold-catalyzed cycloisomerization reaction. This is the first time where this enine rearrangement has been applied to such high complexity. As weird as it looks though, such reactions are somewhat commonly employed. Gold likes to coordinate triple bonds and the resulting electrophilicity can trigger some nice rearrangements. To wrap up the retrosynthesis, the cycloisomerization precursor was accessed from this starting material. So this is the starting point for our forward synthesis. The first step of the synthesis was a simple substitution. The ester was alkylated with the propargylic bromide shown here. Then, a nice palladium catalyzed cyclization from the five membered ring at the core of the natural product. This happens through electrocyclic addition and formation of this intermediary paladar cycle. After a hydrogen shift and reductive elimination to close the catalytic cycle, we get our product. Next, the ester was converted to the methyl ketone. As you might know, throwing Grignard reagents at esters does not result in ketones but rather alcohols due to double addition of the Grignard reagent. To circumvent this, the ester was first converted to the Weinreb amide. This intermediate actually undergoes only one methyl addition and gives us the desired methyl ketone after workup. If you remember the retrosynthesis, this ketone will function as the enolate in the first aldol reaction. But until we get there, we protect it as its acetal. 
Next up, the olefins were functionalized through a double hydroboration oxidation reaction. Remember, hydroboration gives us anti Markovnikov products, where hydroxyls end up at the less substituted carbon. This sequence is also very diastereoselective. If the bulky R substituent at the five membered ring looks down, if you will, borane approaches from the other phase, which leads to the all syn product that was obtained. Also, the secondary hydroxyl group is of course syn to the neighboring hydrogen as well. Next, the primary hydroxyl group was protected to allow functionalization of the secondary hydroxyl group. After oxidation with DMP to the ketone, it was olefinated with this cyclopropyl pitasis reagent to give access to the cyclopropylidine unit. In the same step, reduction with lithium aluminum hydride deprotected the primary hydroxyl group. It was converted to the alkyne through oxidation to the aldehyde and through the modified cyphered gilbert homologation by treatment with the ohira bestman reagent. This set the scene for the really insane key step. In very high yield, the enine was transformed to the bicycle octadiene. Feel free to pause the video to think about or even write down the mechanism of this transformation. It's not that hard. Essentially, the olefin attacks the gold pi complex in a 6 endo dig fashion, giving this tertiary carbocation. This triggers ring expansion of the cyclopropane to the cyclobutane, resulting in this allylic carbocation. After that, we're just a hydrogen shift and deoration away from the product. Now we get to the functionalizations that we've skipped in the retrosynthesis. The diene was regioselectively hydroborated at the more accessible olefin and the resulting allylic alcohol was oxidized. The team faced some challenges with forming the quaternary center but were successful in introducing a cyanide group through a 1,4 addition. Next, the ketone was converted to its enol triflate and cross-coupled with dimethyl zinc to introduce the carbon atom that we need to ultimately form one of the seven member drinks. Now it was time to prepare the first aldol reaction by deprotecting the ketone and converting it to its silyl enol ether. A nice one-pot sequence gave the cycloheptenone after reduction, intramolecular aldol addition and elimination. The authors reported some difficulties in conducting the transformation in a stepwise manner, but they were able to trigger the addition-elimination reaction after dumping in a load of silica gel into the flask after the reduction. Next up is the conjugate addition that surprisingly is very selective for the desired diastereomer, because the methyl group from the cyclobutane interferes with the Burgi-Donitz trajectory from below, the incoming methyl group actually approaches from the top. Now it was time for the second aldol reaction to forge the Harziane skeleton. As discussed, oxidative cleavage of the cyclohexene with ruthenium gave the diketoaldehyde, which undergoes the intramolecular aldol addition with help of some base. The sterically more accessible ketone was then converted to the exocyclic olefin with a Wittig reaction. The remaining ketone was reduced to the alcohol. Now that we are almost through with the synthesis, we need to deal with the useful but redundant hydroxyl groups. To do this, they were deprotonated, reacted with carbon disulfide and methylated. The resulting adduct was the starting material for the barton mccombie deoxygenation that proceeds via a radical pathway. Lastly, the exocyclic olefin had to be converted to the tertiary alcohol. An easy ozonolysis and Grignard addition did the trick here. Again, the addition is highly diastereoselective. However, you might remember the controversy about the actual structure of the natural product. Well, after completing the synthesis of the initially assumed structure, they compared their experimental spectroscopic data with what had been reported in 2014 and found some discrepancies. This triggered them to revisit the initial analytical data and after some reconciliation, they realized that the initial structural assignment was incorrect. There was a nuclear overhauser effect observable for the blue C20 methyl group and the red H14 hydrogen, suggesting that they are spatially close to each other and should thus be on the same face of the 7th membered ring. To prove that hypothesis, they hydrated the exocyclic olefin. The Mukayama hydration gives the desired Markovnikov product and diastereomer. Gratifyingly, the analytical data for this was consistent with the isolation report which ultimately led to a revision in the originally determined structure. Hats off to Hönig and Carrera for publishing this excellent synthesis. 
I hope that you were able to follow my explanations and recognize some themes and that you are as impressed as I am by this fantastic piece of work. Because these videos take a shitload of time for me to make and think about, I would appreciate your support and comments below. Also, press the bell thingy to get notified when I release a new video once in a blue moon. Also, feel free to suggest ideas for new videos. With that said, thanks and have a great start to 2020.